So first thing I'd like to do is introduce myself. My name is Jimmy Peterson. I live up in Wahiawa. I'm about to retire from the Army. Sorry, from the Army uh, this year. So I'm really excited about that. Um, when I was a junior, senior, and a sophomore, um, I was a part of Army JROTC. So I have a lot of experience with being a cadet. Um, I did it for three years. Uh, I did a lot of events, a lot of things. So I sat in your seat uh, just in a different uniform. So um, I understand that some of the things that we'll talk about today is uh, applicable to cadets and seniors, and then some things are applicable to uh, just the seniors during flight, okay? So please uh, maintain uh, your attention on me and whoever's uh, making a, a contribution to the brief. And then I see that there's snacks back there. So if you feel necessary to keep yourself attentive and awake, please go back, grab a snack, uh, grab a drink of water, whatever you need to, and uh, we'll get this going, okay? Um, the first thing I'd like to do is start off with the dad joke, because I am a dad and I have twins due next month. So um, I'm, um, I'm not doing anything. My wife is pregnant. Uh, she's doing all the work right now, okay? But once the babies are born, then I'm pretty much on overtime. All right, so uh, seniors, if you have a notepad, uh, if I could just have one of you raise your hand as a recorder for any questions that uh, get brought up by a cadet or a senior or any recommendations they make. Uh, just go ahead and make a note for me to help me take notes during this brief. Okay. And I get someone to thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so now we'll get to the proper presentation provided to us by National Headquarters. Okay. This is your annual safety risk management day brief. Okay. It's going to be comprised of two different briefs. This one is going to cover operational risk management and filling out a deliberate risk assessment form. That's CAP form 160. Okay. And then we'll have a mishap brief after that. Okay. Today's plan includes, uh, we're going to do a... Uh, Modif or not a modified, but a, a situational risk assessment that is provided in the brief. Uh, we're going to talk about common mishaps in that second brief. We're going to talk about uh, the unit emphasis items on safety and things going forward in 2020. And then obviously throughout the brief, we're going to have open discussion. Okay. Okay. So here we are conducting a risk assessment. Now, when I went to the Army aviator safety officer course back in 2016, uh, I was charged with developing a risk assessment. Okay, and this is similar form, same kind of thing. It actually has the same matrix in it. Um, and so the instructors asked me to provide a risk assessment for an event for my unit. And I said, okay, well, what kind of event can I do this risk assessment for? And they said, whatever you want. And I was like, hmm, okay. Well, um, I was in a UAS platoon, Is that, that's a drone platoon. We fly the little drones that fly over here across the, the runway. And I said, you know, I really like taking my guys out on events. And so I'm also very active in fitness, so why don't I do a risk assessment on doing a hike up Cocoa Head? How many of us have hiked up Cocoa Head? Quite a few of us, yeah? Okay, all of you that didn't raise your hand, you're on the clock. You gotta go do that, okay? Um, and so as I developed this risk assessment, okay, I use the same exact principles here on how to develop, um, uh, or excuse me, how to identify risks, how to assess them, how to supervise all these different steps that we have in this risk management process. And then I realized, as you're climbing this Cocoa Head Trail, um, in, a, in, a, in a safety mindset, there's definitely some areas where you need to do some thinking before you start up that hike. Um, sunscreen, water, what are you gonna do if you have an, an emergency? Can you provide first aid to anyone that maybe, you know, gets a uh, hang nail or anything like that or gets an untied shoe? Uh, you might wanna have some materials to get um, them taken care of, okay? So even though this is for CAP and this is for your safety brief for the year, trust me, there are plenty of other activities we do all year long that you can use this mindset and this safety mindset to help keep you, your family, your friends safe as you go and do all these wonderful activities that we have in Hawaii. Okay, so this personal culture of risk assessment or and risk management is something that CAP wants you to do on a daily basis, okay? Not just when you're wearing the uniform, not just when you're in a brief for CAP, but when you go home and you decide you wanna go outside of your house, maybe go to the park, ride your bike, um, go flying with a senior anytime you're out in the world, they want to try to promote and bring some kind of safety mindset along with that, okay? And we do that very, very easily, and you're probably already doing it, and you don't even realize it, okay? So in the end, we want to do this as a matter of habit, OK? 
okay? This is a matter of habit. It's something that comes naturally, okay? Maybe you're just not thinking of it in a safety realm, but we're gonna try to get you to that point where you're saying, you know, safety is very important, and this is why I think this way. It's because it's gonna result in my risk management of whatever activity I'm doing, okay? <clears throat> Now there's uh, levels of risk management, okay? We have a deliberate risk management, okay? That's very simple. It's just, we have a, maybe a flight or maybe a trip. We're going down to the Polynesian Culture Center and we're going to observe some of the cultural activities at Polynesian Culture Center. There's some risk involved in that. One, we gotta get from point A to point B. So the commander and anyone involved on the senior level is gonna do a deliberate risk assessment to identify hazards, assess hazards, put in some um, controls and supervise that event, okay? It's not just something that we say, go grab the car, or we'll throw some cadets in there, and we go, go right over to the PCC, okay? We're gonna do something deliberate. Now, the real-time risk management, that's for some things that maybe come off the cuff. Maybe they um, were something you weren't expecting, okay? So maybe, you know, there's a, a, a situation after this brief where we have an opportunity to go down to the hangar and look at the aircraft, okay? That would be something that we would do a real-time risk management or a risk assessment and say, okay, before we go over to the hangar, here's some things we need to do, be considerate of as we approach the aircraft, okay? That's a similar, uh, or a, a time where we use a real-time risk management. Okay, we don't wanna accept any unnecessary risk, okay? So a simple example of that is you're driving in a car, has anyone ever heard the, the mantra that if you're sitting in the back seat, you don't need to wear a seatbelt? Mm -hmm. I don't know where that came from. That's not how I grew up. I just know that if you're riding in a vehicle, you wear your seatbelt. Okay. You gotta be real careful with this cable, right? Because if that cable, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Um, okay, uh, we wanna make risk decisions at the appropriate level, okay? If we're doing a, a, a yearly event where we have a different facility, we have outside of CAT personnel involved. We have maybe a media team. Maybe we have other flying um, institutions participating in an event. That's going to be something that's going to be at the level, probably at the squadron commander level or maybe even at the wing commander level. Okay, But then we might have risk decisions that need to be made at the cadet command level or maybe just at the cadet between cadet level. Okay, So one of the things that I was... Uh, quickly corrected on uh, during a run uh, one morning, um, and I'm sure Mr. Dean would uh, agree, the, the army folks on Schofield really like you to use the crosswalks. <laughs> they really like to use, use the crosswalks, okay? So I'm not very senior in the army, okay? I'm just a lowly old warrant officer, and let me tell you, some lieutenant colonel in the army made a very quick correction of me, not that I wasn't using the crosswalk, but I was using the crosswalk when there was the hand. Oh. Yeah, okay. So, was I wrong? You better believe it, okay. Now, was he right to make the correction? Of course, okay. So, what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's just certain things that you can assist each other on, okay. Maybe there's a cadet that wants to cross the street on a hand and you see it and it's like, hey, well, let's, let's, just, let's just wait, okay. You may look left and right, to and fro, and you don't see anything, but you just never know. You follow the, the uh, applicable signs and lights, and you should be fine, okay? Um, and then we want to integrate risk management into all of our missions and activities, and I kind of talked about that initially. Um, as we go through this process, we want to apply that risk management continuously before, during, and after, okay? So it's very important to keep in mind how you're going to uh, implement these five steps, okay? So who can give me that first step? What's it say at the top in number one? Go ahead, buddy. Identify hazards. Identify hazards, okay. What, is, what do you think that means? Can I get a senior to help me out with that? What do you mean by identify hazards? What can hurt you? What can hurt you, very good. Oh, man. See? Very good, I like your style, okay. So what can hurt you, okay? So if you're walking and you're about to cross the street, what can hurt you if you're trying to cross the street? A moving vehicle, okay? Um, then we want to assess that hazard. All right, that's very simple. It's kind of self-explanatory. How likely and how badly may you be injured or how badly would something be damaged if it's property um, if you do not take uh, consideration for that risk? 
Um, and then as um, individuals, leaders, commanders, we want to make sure we implement controls, okay? Or excuse me, identify controls. We want to say, okay, we're going to do this to make sure that that risk does not impact me in a negative way. I'm going to use the crosswalk. I'm going to use the crosswalk when the light is operating at the right time, okay? As leaders and as uh, individuals, we want to implement those controls and then at all times we want to evaluate and make sure that our controls that we've decided on are still appropriate, okay? Because maybe there's a condition that's different. Maybe it's raining outside, so maybe you can't see the signs properly, so maybe you need some assistance. There's just always things that will change about your situation <coughs> that may change what you're util utilizing as your uh, controls and your implementations. Okay, seniors, how can we uh, uh, relate this to uh, a flight? So, a lot of times, or actually for every mission, we're supposed to have a mission safety officer. And that person is supposed to kind of be able to take a step back, look at all the processes without getting too involved in any single thing. And they're supposed to say, hey, uh, let's rethink that. There's maybe a little bit of danger here or risk that we're not talking about or that we glossed over or whatever. So that person, the mission safety officer, can basically go to the incident commander at any time just as any of us can and say, hey, uh, we probably need to take a couple of steps back or take a pause and reassess or uh, talk about this risk. Okay, so how many of us are instrument rated in airplanes or helicopters? A couple of us, right? What's a big thing that's involved in, in flying instruments? When, when you're in you're the pilot command, you're on the controls, what is the one thing that you really want to focus on? In the, scan the instruments, okay? So if we apply this in the aircraft during an instrument flight, we are applying the, the mantra of paying attention to everything, okay? So we can't just focus on our airspeed, we have to focus on our altitude. We have to focus on the attitude of the aircraft. And even if we focus on the attitude, we have to go back to the altimeter at some point. We've got to go back to the airspeed at some point. We've got to go back to where we're at on our heading, where we're at on our vertical uh, climb or descent. There's a lot of things that are going on during an instrument flight that you need to divide your attention. Okay, So dividing attention is very important and this is typically why we fly, why most organizations like to fly with two pilots because it's very difficult for a single pilot to divide his attention because he's got so much going on. So as you are executing whatever duties you have here at CAP, we want to try to divide our attention. We want to develop some kind of scan to say, you know, I see this big shiny thing over here, but I got to remember there's potentially other things going on, okay? So, uh, great. Thank you for all everyone's contributions, okay? As we go through the next portion, um, we're going to be talking about some of the different portions of the um, risk management matrix, okay? So one of the things is identifying hazards. Okay, and this is going to go into uh, the CAP Form 160, and you'll see it up here. Uh, it's kind of broken down into little blocks here, and then we'll get a little bit bigger version where it shows the entire form, okay, and then you'll be able to kind of follow along. Blocks four and five, okay, they're going to talk about subactivity or specific task and the hazard associated, okay. <clears throat> and as we do that, we're going to gather a team, we're going to talk about questions for the activity, how can it go wrong? What can break? How can someone get hurt? Okay, these are all the what if questions. Uh, have you done anything like this before? So this is where your experiences can come into play. Have I flown instruments in Hawaii before? Have I only flown instruments somewhere on the mainland? How different is it when you are flying over at Kaneohe Bay on an instrument uh, approach and you turn away from the island? How many of us have done that? I will tell you, when you're flying instruments, flying away from the island at night, what do you think you see out there? Darkness. Very good. I have never seen anything more dark than flying instruments away from Oahu and there is not a street light, not a cell phone, not a, not a street light or anything like that out there to see. So it's very much, you get into this um, situation like, man, if I haven't seen this before, this is very, very, um, I guess, get you, get you your chicken skin, kind of gets you paying attention to things, okay? So if you have experience with those kinds of things, then you can apply that to whatever you're doing. Okay, and then we want to assess the risk. Okay, probability and severity are the two things that will um, give us our risk level. Okay, 
probability, just how probable, how likely is this going to happen, okay? So if we're talking about how likely is it for me to get struck by lightning, it's not that likely, okay? But if it does happen, now we're talking about severity. How severe could my injuries be if I was struck by lightning? Well, pretty severe. Has anyone ever been struck by lightning? Anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get struck by lightning either, so I, I agree with everyone. Um, but you can see where the probability and severity can uh, apply. Now, if I'm crossing the street, how likely is it for me to get hit by a car? Depends, right? Now you start to get into situational um, scenarios where maybe if I'm crossing the road where I'm supposed to, when the light says the thing I'm supposed to, where it's supposed to, what it's supposed to say. Or maybe I'm crossing at a jaywalk section where there's no crosswalk. It's 16 lanes of traffic, you know, like you get somewhere on H1. You know, there's 17 cars from side to side. Maybe you don't want to cross there. You know, we want to go underneath on Cam Highway and take the, the crosswalk, okay? Um, and we continue to use the risk matrix on um, the form, okay, which is going to be page three, okay? And then you can see here, uh, it may be a little difficult to read for those in the back, okay? But we got um, our risk assessment matrix. Here talks about severity, and here talks about probability, okay? So when we start at the top, okay, this is going to be associated with EH. Can anybody tell me what EH stands for? extremely high risk, okay? So if we liken this to uh, a military operation, this, this kind of operation at extremely high risk usually requires some kind of general officer to approve it, okay? So not too many of us are willing to, one, conduct that kind of operation, or two, even ask permission, okay? So this is associated with a catastrophic event, okay? A death, an unaccessible loss, mission failure, these are all the kind of things that will be associated. Okay, then we have critical, okay? Still extremely high, but now you can see where it plugs into the probability side of this matrix, okay? The probability side says, even though it's a critical, where it may be severe injury, illness, or loss, or damage, because it's a frequent probability, then that remains extremely high, okay? So we can see how our probability and our severity are giving us our proper risk uh, assessment. Okay, now if it's unlikely, way down over there at the right, and negligible, okay, it's possible occurrences, but very improbable, minimal injury, loss, or damage, little no impact to the readiness of our unit or to mission capability, then we're going to be able to mark it as a low, okay? Any questions on the matrix? I think a few of us have seen this before, yes? Yeah. Sorry, did I skip two? Okay, so as we are developing risk controls, we want to reduce probability and re reduce severity, okay? So if we take our example of, um, let's see, we're climbing up Cocoa Head, okay? Those of us have, that have seen it or walked up it, um, there's some probability of falls, yes? Okay, some, some pretty big probability of falls. Um, you're probably not gonna fall up the mountain, but you might fall down, okay? And then maybe the severity is pretty high, okay? So could I get someone to give me a, a percentage, zero to 100, of the probability of a fall on Cocoa Head? 50-50. 50-50, so like a coin flip? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to our little matrix, okay? Where do you think it is? Do you think that's a frequent, an occasional, or unlikely? Occasional. Occasional. <coughs> I agree. Okay, right in the middle, okay? Now, let's go back. Severity. How severe is that same fall on Cocoa Head potentially be from 0 to 100? 0 being you don't have any scratches at all, and 100 meaning that you're probably going to have a lot of people visiting you at the hospital. 100%? 100 percent? Okay. Yeah, okay. What might be a, an important factor in that? It depends where you fall from. Depends on where you fall, right? Depends on where you mm -hmm. fall, what's around you, okay? You, have you been there? Yes. You have. You remember the portion that is a bridge? Uh -huh. Yeah, a little scary right there? Yeah. Well, I've taken my wife up, well, my wife's taken me up there many times. <laughs> and every time, I always see someone 
which is, sorry gentlemen, it's always a, a guy that is crawling on his hands and knees across this bridge and all the ladies are just running right across. <laughs> so I don't know who the scaredy cats are, but um, if you fall on that portion, it might be a little bit worse, might be a little bit more severe if you fall, right? Okay, so now we're talking about situational stuff. So I could say that, if we go back to our little matrix, oh, hello, There's, click happy. There it is. Okay. Okay. So we could probably say somewhere in the moderate to critical area. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay. So we might have a severe injury. We might have a minor injury. Either one is capable. Okay. So as, as leaders, as members of the unit, we can talk to each other and determine what that's going to be. Okay. And so this is important. So as we talk about this, we already agreed that it was occasional. Okay, so somewhere in here, we're going to pick one. So it's going to be high, high, medium, or low. And then we talked about moderate or critical, okay? And so because that bridge is a little scary and it's got a big drop, I think we should probably put it at critical, okay? So we're going to go ahead and put those two together, and it's going to give us a high risk. Okay, so remember that, high risk for a fall at Cocoa Head. Okay? These are some things that we can do. We can eliminate, reduce, train, warn, prepare, Improve and supervise, okay? These are all the things that we can do to minimize this risk. Okay? Then we'll continue with these risk controls, okay? We're going to have a risk control and how to implement that control in the form. Okay? And then we're going to prioritize these risk controls, okay? We're going to focus first on the hazards that bring the highest level of risk, okay? So probably one of the first things we're going to talk about is the bridge on the, on the trail, okay? And then we might talk about the, uh, the loose dirt, okay? Maybe other hikers that are a potential hazard, okay? How many of us have seen folks wearing slippers of Cocoa Head? Okay, barefoot, I've seen folks barefoot of Cocoa Head. Mm -hmm. I've even seen ladies in wedges, okay? I only know what those are because of my wife. Uh, but uh, probably not the appropriate footwear, okay? And that comes into some of our uh, risk controls later on, okay? Okay, and then we're gonna assess the residual risk. Who can try to define for me Residual risk. Anyone, anyone <coughs> volunteer, very brave, very brave soul. Risk Mr. Dean. that uh, no matter what kind of, what you implement, it's potentially still going to be there. Um, Hawaii, it's generally sunny, so a residual risk would be the risk of sunburn because the sun's out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a great point. What we're looking for, though, is what risk we still have even after we implement our controls, okay? So we have a risk of a fall. We said that we're in to um, reduce the risk of our hike. We're not even gonna hike up through the bridge. We're gonna stop at the bridge and we're gonna turn around and come back, okay? That is a potential risk control. Now, that would probably be unfortunate because you wouldn't be able to get to the top Okay, and you'd be sad because you'd make it to the top, but that is a risk control that you can decide. Okay, and what that will do is when we come back, okay, hopefully I don't go crazy on the slides. Let's do it. There we go. There we go. Okay, we get back to this. We were here, correct? On high, mm -hmm. and if we decide we're not going to go up that bridge, then we could probably go down here to negligible. Okay, right. towards minimal. Uh, injury, loss, or damage of equipment, little or no impact to unit radio submission capability. That's probably something we can uh, agree upon. Okay? But who wants to stop at the bridge? Right? No one. No one wants to stop at the bridge. Like, if you go skydiving, you don't want to get up to the top and decide, you know, it's kind of risky for me to actually jump out. I'm just going to ride the plane back down. Probably not. I'm probably going to want to jump out. Who's jumped out of a plane before? Okay? With a parachute? <laughs> I haven't done that, though. No. That's scary. The mission was to get to the top, right? That's right. That's right. So, if you don't get to the top, then it's going to be complete. Okay, so, now that we know what residual risk is, now we want to assess our residual risk, okay? With your risk controls in place and working, each risk should be reduced, okay? Each risk should be reduced after you implement a control, okay? So, if your control keeps you at a certain level, if he keeps you at a high, after you originally assessed it as a high, what I can tell you as a, uh, you know, newly minted safety officer is that you probably have a bad risk control. You probably need to do some more assessment and do some more t discussing with the folks around you and try to figure out something that works a little bit better. 
Okay. <clears throat> Again, you want to go back to the risk matrix to determine the residual risk with your risk control in place. We decided that we're going to stop at the bridge. Okay. And now we've determined that we can go down to a low. And this is all stuff you can add to your risk assessment worksheet. Okay. <clears throat> now, one of the most important components of risk management is the loop, signifying that the risk management must be a continuous process. Okay must be a continuous process, okay? So if I decide that I wanna go ahead and I'm feeling a little sleepy and I wanna get back there and grab one of those cupcakes, okay? I have to assess the risk, what's that's gonna do to my waistline, okay? Is it gonna cause my waistline to get a little tight on that belt? And all of a sudden this, you know, high quality belt buckle decides to remove itself from the belt? Now we have flying projectiles, okay? <laughs> How risky is that for everyone? That's pretty risky, okay? That's a lot of pressure. All right, so maybe I want to go ahead and leave that over there for someone that is, a, you know, a, a steely-eyed cadet, ready to go, flat-bellied, barrel-chested, okay? Can handle a cupcake. Maybe I don't want to do that because I, I am retiring this year, so can't say that I've gotten skinnier. Um, okay, so we want to make sure that we maintain that loop, okay? We're always identifying, we're always implementing risk controls, we're always assessing our, is everything I've decided to do to re reduce that risk, is it still worthy? Is it still giving me the most safest execution of my mission? The most safest execution of my daily uh, activities, okay? My activities with my family and my friends, okay? And then lastly, um, and this is very important for our leaders, but important for everyone, because eventually everyone will have some kind of leadership position in your life, whether you are a military person, you're working at a company, you're just with your family, at some point you're gonna have to take charge, okay? So you always wanna supervise and evaluate. Is everything going like I anticipated? Everything going like I planned, okay? Do I need to make changes, okay? And at the end of it all, Okay, the Army folks in the, in the room, and maybe the Air Force, I'm not really sure, we love our after action reviews, our AARs, okay? What's the worst thing that happens with the AARs once we do AARs? They get put on a slideshow, and then we never see them again, right? That may or may not be a condition in the Air Force too, I'm not sure, okay, but definitely in the Army. Yes, sir? Are there various types of controls? Various types of controls. <coughs> so you can have controls that are determined by um, your command, so CAP headquarters, okay? Regulation, okay? Local policy, okay? Commander's decisions, leader's decisions, and then maybe just some self controls that you decide on your own, okay? Um, an example. Anyone ride motorcycles? Couple of us riding motorcycles, maybe aspiring. Okay, I have a rule. Anytime I rode my motorcycle, I'm not even going to look at any kind of alcoholic beverage. No matter what. I don't care if I had a, a mimosa with breakfast with family on, on Christmas morning and I wanted to ride my motorcycle at night. Okay, that night I am not riding my motorcycle. Zero percent, never, never, ever, ever. Okay, that is just a decision I have made on my own. Okay. Not everyone follows certain things about lifestyle and things like that. That's just something I've decided. So that's an individual thing. Now, with this, there's some things that CAP headquarters says that you will do, okay, to implement some kind of controls. One of those things is this very brief. So every year there's a safety day, right, Mr. Herrera? We have a safety day, and that's one of their risk controls to say we're going to brief all of our folks on a particular topic every year, and we're going to take a day and we'll focus on safety. That is a risk control that they've decided at that level that they have delegated down to us at the unit safety officer level to present, okay? Now I know you don't think I'm very savvy on electronics and you thought I built this whole pres presentation on my own. I really didn't, okay? CAP headquarters brought that to us, okay? I made a couple changes to make it applicable for our uh, wing and our unit, okay? But this is something that they wanted us to share with all of the units and every unit <laughs> across CAP is receiving the same training, okay? Does that answer your question? So, uh, in OSHA, there's uh, two caps. One is administrative controls, which you talked a lot about rules. Yep. Uh, so, you have a dangerous building. Kids don't go in there. So, the, that's the rule, right? You can break the rule and then go inside to that dangerous house that might collapse. And then you have engineering controls, which is, I'm gonna board it up, nailed shut, they can't go in, physically can't go in. 
So um, that's the two distinctions and types of controls. And we focus a lot on administrative, but kids don't always listen to parents for some reason. I don't know why. So sometimes it's good to just seal the thing. You can't go. Even if I leave, I lock the door. Right. So a great example of that is uh, a lot of units will have uh, lockers with hazardous materials, paints, this, things of this nature, okay? And as a engineering control, they'll go ahead and throw a lock on it, okay? And it's not because they don't want you folks to use it, it's that they don't want folks to put other items in there that are not applicable to that particular space, okay? So um, there are certain things that we just don't want to mix together, maybe certain things that will be damaged or, or just, you know, something like that, um, that will provide that engineering control where we have a lock or some kind of do not enter, like you were saying, boarding things up. Um, that's a very good point. And, but uh, the administrative stuff, you're kind of hoping and, 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 and trusting that folks were gonna, are going to comply, right? But unfortunately, not everyone always complies with things. So maybe we give another suggestion by just blocking it off, okay? Any other questions on that? Very good. Okay. So we've just been assigned to do a risk assessment, okay? I believe we've kind of discussed this risk assessment, so we're gonna pass over the, um, doing the risk assessment, okay? Um, this gives you just an example um, of members arriving to a squadron early as cadets and the parents leaving the cadet um, maybe right there outside the door. There's no one here from CAP, um, so they assess that risk as a high with a, a cadet without supervision with from the parents or from a, um, a two um, senior uh, committee or team to provide that. It goes over the uh, matrix, just like we were talking about, okay? <coughs> All about controlling the hazards. What happens, you know, uh, a welcome team should be meeting and greeting the cadet uh, when they arrive to the squadron um, because they may be injured out there. Maybe it rains and it's windy and they get cold and maybe sick or, you know, un you know, God forbid, some kind of, uh, you know, nefarious activity from someone outside of CAP. Uh, we don't want that either, so we can implement some kind of control with a member team um, responsible for welcoming cadets. Um, so this is kind of what they're talking about in the uh, example here. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pass through this. Okay, now the senior members, there's a little bit of a different application to risk management, okay, and that's particular to flight, okay. Now, <coughs> As far as I'm uh, understanding, there needs to be a risk assessment complete prior to every flight. Okay, so that's a requirement for everyone that takes an aircraft on a flight. Okay, so that training comes with your um, your your training as you become a senior member that is authorized to fly. Um, you will be doing those deliberate risk assessments prior to every flight. That happens in the Air Force. That happens in the Army. Uh, very important for any time we're operating aircraft. Okay. Same thing, it talks about mixing ammonia and bleach. Okay, um, does anyone not know about ammonia and bleach and mixing? Okay, you never wanna mix ammonia and bleach. It develops a uh, hazardous gas, okay, and can be very hazardous to your health, okay? So please do not mix ammonia and bleach. Anytime you have a cleaner, you wanna use that one cleaner. Only use that one cleaner. Make sure that once you're finished using that cleaner, that you rinse whatever surface or area that you're utilizing the cleaner in is properly rinsed, okay? And then you can potentially use another cleaner, okay? But at all times, as cadets, you wanna make sure that you have some supervision and you ask permission for these kinds of hazardous materials, okay? Uh, and then it just brings it down to a low with some of our uh, risk controls implemented, okay? This is our... Uh, Completion of the risk management brief. Okay, do I have any questions at this time before we go on to mishaps? We, we covered mishaps the first safety meeting of, of uh, 2020. So first week of January, so we covered mishaps. Okay. Sorry, you guys don't get to hear me talk anymore. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I will give you one more thing, uh, two more things, okay. Um, there has been many opportunities for me to implement risk controls and risk uh, management, 
Um, one of those was on a flight I had years ago uh, in North Carolina. Um, I had a, a pilot with me. I was the pilot in command as an instructor pilot, and the gentleman felt some resistance and binding on the flight controls, particularly the pedals. Uh, he notified me um, that he felt something a little off, okay? And I took the controls from my student, and we were not very far from the airfield, about two miles out um, on a downwind, an extended downwind, and uh, I decided to fly the aircraft back to the airfield. Okay, and by the way, this is uh, me admitting a mistake, so uh, please bear with me and, and be, be nice. Um, I took the controls and I decided that I was going to return to our home airfield, okay? Um, was able to fly the aircraft. I could feel the resistance in the, in the controls, okay? But I felt pretty comfortable with it. It didn't feel that bad, okay? And so I called for a normal approach, normal landing. I landed to a hover, because uh, I was in a helicopter. I landed to a hover. Our maintenance pad or our maintenance area that we take aircraft that need maintenance was not too far away, maybe uh, 200 feet. And I asked for a uh, reposition by a hover over to that maintenance area and I landed and shut down. Immediately notified my commander of the uh, malfunction, put it in the logbook of the aircraft. Everything else all well, no one got hurt, everything like that. They identified the problem, made the repair. A couple of days later, we're having a safety stand down day just like this. I tell my story and I was thinking about it up until that day where we had a safety stand on it and I said, you know, I probably could have done something a little bit different, okay? Now, for those of you who have ne never read the manual for the aircraft, the, um, uh, the emergency procedure requires you to land as soon as possible and emergency shutdown without delay, okay? So, did I do that? Not quite, okay? So, in controlled flight, um, the flight control malfunction is not, um, it has the potential to be a severe event, but it's not really the case for helicopters. Where you really get into problems with helicopters is when you're at a hover and you have a flight control malfunction. That's when it can get very severe very fast. So my inability to declare an emergency upon approach to the runway, my decision to hover after my landing and my decision to reposition by hover over to the maintenance pad was the three mistakes that I made that day that could have potentially resulted in a um, damaged aircraft or even damaged humans, okay? So um, again, I was focused, okay? Remember, paying attention at it? And by the way, I did it, right? Okay, but what I did not do is I did not divide my attention and say, hey, Peter Pilot sitting next to me, have I covered everything that I need to cover? Is there anything that I should be doing that I'm not doing? I have this emergency under control. I feel that we can get where we need to go and land safe, okay? But is there anything I'm missing? He probably would have said, you know, we probably should declare an emergency because this technically is an emergency. We probably should just land the helicopter once we get to the runway, something like that, okay? Um, so please be humble enough to ask questions of your fellow CAP members, your family, your friends and say, do you really think I'm doing this thing the safest way? Am I doing this thing with, with everything considered? Is there any way I could be doing this better? Okay, any more safe, okay? So as you heard my story of, of not being so safe and, and, and being focused on one particular thing, um, hopefully that gives you a, an example to think about next time you're in a situation and you're trying to uh, minima or manage your focus and trying to divide your attention amongst different things. And the last thing I have is um, I went flying with Mr. Dean a couple days ago and the food I had flying that little Cessna 172, it wasn't that good. It was a little plain. Uh, it was a little plain. Uh, <laughs> if I don't have any questions, thank you very much for your attention. I'll give it back to Mr. Curl. All right, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, just by way of administration, we do have a safety board over there, and the new 60-2, the safety regulation, is posted, all right? So everybody, it is available for anybody who wants to look at it. And right next to it, on the right-hand side, are those blank risk assessment forms. So if you don't know where, one, uh, where to find one, it's up there. There's multiple copies. Take one, uh, practice with it, figure out how it works. But that board is not there for decoration. That board is there for your use, okay?